Hi, Tina. How, hi, Wally. Welcome back. It's always good to see you guys at our meetings. Hope everyone's having a great week so far. I think we're getting back into the rhythm of things after the holidays. I think this is like the first um, week where everything is kind of just back to normal again. <laughs> uh, we're live on Facebook as well. So if you're joining us from there, welcome. Um, we got some new faces as well. Welcome, welcome. So if you're new to our town halls, we host these every single week as just a free space for Montessori leaders to come together and discuss important leadership topics. We make them always free and, you know, the more the merrier. Please spread the word to your fellow Montessori leaders. We'd love to see you guys here. We think it's important to have a space for collaboration, connection, and support, especially when you're leading a school. It can oftentimes be lonely. It's good to have a group that you can go to for advice. We invite um, incredible Montessori thought leaders to come and share their wisdom and expertise. And today we have with us Rupali Sharma. She's going to be talking about team building. Um, she is... Um, actually trained as an architect and now runs the tech schools um, in Worcester, um, Massachusetts. Sorry if I butchered that. My pronunciation of city names yeah, are not always Worcester. best. <laughs> Worcester. And it's so sad because I live in England and that's an English Worcester. city name. <laughs> school. She um, works with schools um, and she helps to apply um, different techniques in business management um, alongside leveraging the Montessori philosophy. She works with organizations to create the ideal work environment and set the stage with resources and challenge individuals to achieve high standards. She's here today to share her wisdom with you all. Um, her discussion today will be a little bit of a workshop, so feel free to take notes. Um, there'll be some questions, so participate. We, lo we love to see that. Um, we love to hear your ideas and perspectives. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Rupali so she can share her presentation with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Happy New Year, everyone. It's great to be back and good to see some familiar names. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to start with um, aspirations. And, um, you know, all of us wear many hats. Um, what are the different hats that you wear? Um, and Rupali, we can't hear you. You seem to have locked up a little bit. Rupali, we can't hear you. You seem to have locked you, up a little bit. Can you, Rupali, you hear me now? Can't hear you. You seem to have locked you, up a little bit. Can you, Rupali, you hear me now? Can't hear you. You seem to have locked you, up a little bit. Can you, Rupali, you hear me now? Can't hear you. You seem to have locked you, up a little bit. I think the problem is with Camille. <laughs> There's a little bit of a repeat. The problem is oh, am I back? Oh, yes. Am I back? Camila, let me know when I should start. I can hear you now. I Camila, think... let me know when I should start. Oh, I can hear you now. Camila, let me know when I should start. I can hear you now. Camila, let me know when I should start. Is this better? Better now? Great. All right. So let's begin. Um, we all run our teams, we run schools, we run organizations. How do we nurture our team and how do we help them achieve their highest potential so that the, the organization, the school can achieve its highest potential. So what does the highest potential mean? And I'd like to just open 
the forum for a conversation what do, what does it mean to you uh, to have the highest potential maria montessori talked about the human potential so let's um, discuss and make sure that we are all on the same page about the term highest potential would anyone like to share their thoughts i think um, when you say highest potential what i believe is that uh, the person is always trying to strive to do a better job and always wondering where they can improve and not just be satisfied with uh, where they are and what they have learned and just stay with the status quo. Thank you, Ali. Yeah. Anybody I, else? I also think of uh, uh, each team member knowing their strengths and kind of uh, knowing how they can lean on each other to kind of have a, a full and stronger team as a whole, and then knowing areas of growth. Thank you. Is what I was going to say to you, um, just always, always growing, always working to grow, to learn new things. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, everyone, for sharing that. You know, all of us um, in uh, in the world, every human being has the potential to do more and to contribute to the human good, to everyone around the world. And are we really working towards a potential? Are we really thriving as humanity? How do we get ourselves and our team members to get to that level? So I'd like to start by sharing that Organizations and teams are made up of people. This is uh, our first staff meeting back from the holidays and our office manager, she got us these little wine glasses. She had little seltzer. We are not drinking wine at school. Uh, this is the seltzer, but she just was so festive and everyone got a little uh, gift in, in uh, wrapped in a tissue paper with some gold and red ribbon. And you can see, you know, it was just, hey, welcome back, happy new year to everyone. And so all um, organizations are made up of individuals. You can see that, you know, you can have a beautiful building, you can have a lovely environment, but if the individuals are not there, it's just an empty shell. And so knowing that your team is made up of individuals, it's not, not just the assets, but they are your most uh, wonderful assets. So to start with, who am I? We all know this question in Montessori. Who am I? We're then going to talk about fundamental needs. What are the fundamental needs of your team? And then how do we meet those needs? Um, and I'm sorry, I. This uh, three-year cycle, I would just say, is um, my way of thinking about it takes three years for a Montessori teacher to get there. So giving yourself time. And then who are we? So we started with the question, who am I? And then we are going to the question, who are we? And what is our team's potential? So a quick... Um, exercise for everybody. Who am I? And I'd like you to write about yourself. What are the different hats you wear? You're not just a school administrator. You're not just a classroom teacher. You are a parent. You are a spouse. You are a daughter or a son. You're, you are um, a friend. You are a caregiver. You may be uh, doing some social service work and volunteering. What are the different hats that you wear? So let's take a few minutes to, um, to write down the different hats, the different roles you play, and what are your personal aspirations? Just individually, who are you? What, what are your goals? What do you strive for? What makes you get up every day and 
Start your day wherever you are. What do you do throughout your, your day that um, you participate in life? What are some of your hopes and dreams? And um, what are the different social environments that you work in? Is it your family? Is it your uh, school? Is it your church or another uh, spiritual group that you may be part of? Is it sports? What, what are the communities that you engage with? And how do you fit in those communities? That in elementary years, Maria Montessori talks about these big questions. Who am I? Is it just your bank balance? Uh, is it just your house or your assets? Are you more than your assets or, or your material needs? Um, how do you fit in? How do I fit in? And how do I contribute to my community? So let's take a few minutes. And then when you're ready, if some of you would like to share, we'll uh, do a quick sharing. Who are the other people who are engaged with you in your community? Who, who matters? Which people matter in your community? You can even add that. Would anyone like to share your initial thoughts? I'll go. Uh, I wrote, sure. I am a Chinese American strong woman who is a mother of two amazing girls that I hope will grow up with strong voices of their own. I own WB Spar School, a nature-based Montessori school in New York City, and I am someone that grows teacher leaders. I'm also a dancer, a great friend, a volunteer at my daughter's schools, and the mother of my fur baby, Olive, our Frenchie. Thank you. Thank you for everything that you do. Um, it makes the world a better place. Anybody else? You could just share maybe one or two things, maybe one hat that you wear. All right, I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll share a little bit about myself. I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, I'm a daughter-in-law. I am a teacher, I'm an artist, I'm an architect and um, I enjoy painting, I enjoy reading, I like to be outdoors. I also like to think um, and uh, I love poetry, I write poetry. The way I engage in life is by doing things. So um, I'm part of the community in my area. I have networking groups with women. I help women work on their, um, their personal goals. And uh, at, at uh, our school, we are building a community. We are not just building a school. We are part of Worcester, the, the, the city. We work with other community partners to make uh, an enriching environment for our students. And in the same way, we give back to the community too. So those are some of the hats uh, I wear. And you know, all of us have many hats we have our own aspirations and in your team 
your team members also have their own personal aspirations. So are you in tune with your team members' aspirations? Are they aligned with your school's aspirations? Because if the alignment is not there, then they're going on two different tracks. And there is this question of work-life balance and, oh, I don't feel good about myself over here because there is a disconnect. But these two paths have to converge and diverge and converge and diverge um, again and again. And so it's important to get to know your team and get to know uh, how, how how can their aspirations become part of the school's aspirations? How can they contribute to the school so that they can feel fulfilled in their role at the school? What, what are the results that will satisfy them? Um, how do they fit in socially as well as in the hierarchy of your school? In a smaller school, it's a close knit community. As your school grows, and if you have multiple campuses, then you have a hierarchical structure. How do people fit in within that? How, how can they be recognized and acknowledged in that structure? So those are questions to think about. So I came across this very interesting um, picture about the fundamental needs of a Montessori educator. Now we know the fundamental needs of humans. There are spiritual needs and there are material needs. Well, um, whoever made this uh, poster is really very creative. So I, I love this, you know, your spiritual needs are inspiration. What is your why? Why do you do what you do? Um, what are your uh, affirmations and perspectives. How do you uh, bring those affirmations into the work that you do so that people can trust you, your students can trust you, your coworkers can trust you, your management can trust you, you can trust your employees. Um, there is a lot of give and take over there. And then in terms of uh, perspective, what are times uh, that are set aside for reflection, for for dreaming and for thinking big because the why of you and your organization is going to drive everybody. You are the leader and you want to take your ship in one direction and to get everybody looking in that direction, facing the same way, speaking with one voice, that inspiration has to remain every day at the forefront for everybody. The second part is the material needs. So what are your employees' material needs? Um, is it their classrooms? Is it the environment? Is it planning time, record keeping time, uh, progress report? This is the progress report time right now at our school and giving time for those. Uh, what about the tools and equipment that they need in their classrooms um, and the support that, that they might need? So let's talk about the spiritual needs. How, how do you identify um, with your mission? Is it a workshop that is done? You know, everybody does, does a deep dive for one day at a professional development uh, moment that you do a deep dive into your um, mission statement, your vision, or is it that you show the mission by example? How do you practice what your mission statement says? And um, you know, every teacher or every employee thrives when there is respect for their intellect, for who they are. What are the different ways that you are acknowledging the individuality of each member in your team. And um, what are you doing for their participation to keeping them in the loop, to have time to 
to say what worked, what didn't work? What are you doing to say, here is where we are going next and how are you keeping up with that optimism? So let's take a couple of minutes. Would anyone like to share some of the ideas that they've been doing and then I can also share some of the work that we are doing. How, how do you work with your mission statement? How, how does it become alive in your schools? I can talk a little bit. Um, so we, in the beginning of the year before the school year started, we looked at our existing mission statement and kind of uh, did a brainstorm around different values and noticed that the things that we cared about didn't actually really match with the mission statement. So we ended up retooling it. And then um, at the end of every monthly staff meeting, the whole staff meeting, we all reflect on like, what have we done to serve the mission statement? And we kind of share that out. And um, so like how it lives and breathes in our practice. And then in January, we did a cycle of reflection and um, and then that kind of informed our what's what we're going to do in the spring as far as goal setting. So we had six different domains and we talked we like brainstormed and thought about what uh, we can, we think is an is an effective teacher in all of these different domains. So then we kind of created like I don't know a standard that we are trying to strive for, and then we're gonna have conversations about goal setting for the spring semester. And what we noticed is that not our entire our entire team, teaching team doesn't have common planning time just because of the structure of afternoons and you know the afternoon extended day teachers versus the the full day teachers. So now we're creating um, carving out like extra planning time and before their the extended day teachers start their day and then giving them extra hours to plan with their team, which is a financial, um, you know, commitment that we need to make that will help everyone feel more important. Yeah. Right. And, and that's um, the whole idea is that you spend time taking apart the mission statement and saying, is this what we mean what, when we say we're, what we're doing? And then actually implementing it in the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you, you have to um, abide by your mission statement on a daily basis. It cannot be a one-off. And that, uh, that sense of life of your school comes from the leadership, comes from how you engage uh, with the mission statement on a day-to-day -day basis. And then listening to your team members. So now you have your business goals of enrollment or of uh, outcomes, student outcomes. And those have to be aligned with, um, with the mission statement and saying now, as L Lani, thank you for sharing that. As you correctly said, do we have time to get to all of the goals that we stated that we ought to do? And if we don't have time, what can the administration do to make time um, for, for the uh, employees? And then um, your perspective, uh, where, when do you have time to reflect? Is it during your staff meetings? Are you covering time? Because when uh, an activity is done and then you say what worked, what didn't work, it actually allows people to uh, say, how can I be better? And when, when um, employees are not micromanaged, but are allowed that freedom to think, they can come up with some really good ideas. And do you have the trust in your, um, in your team to say, I value those inputs? So are you afraid to embrace your team or are you out there with open arms to embrace your team? So that's something to think about. When you also, um, you know, individuals like to contribute. That's what I've learned over time. That even as a head of school, I cannot do everything that I want to do because I'm limited by my strengths and my challenges. So I have been open about saying to my team, all right, I really don't get this, or I, I need help. And I'm just amazed to see that, you know, when, when I ask for help, how much 
uh, people do. For example, today morning, I had a family alliance meeting and I had prepared my agenda. I sent it out to our office administrator and asked her to print copies. And I know that when I do that, she is going to read through my notes carefully. And lo and behold, she called me and said, well, there are typos and your dates are all wrong. And she fixed them. And um, when I uh, met with the parents, she made me look good because everything was done correctly. So are you depending on your team and do you trust them? And do you acknowledge their, their um, participation in the work that you do? So those are the spiritual needs. That really affects the, the emotional center of the brain and people will want to work at your school or at your organization if emotionally they feel that they belong there. So that sense of belonging has to be there. The next part is the material needs. We live in a material world. What are the needs? We've talked about the basic needs of human. Nourishment, tea, coffee, snacks, water, simple things. These are such simple things and they don't cost a lot. Um, everybody at our school knows how much our teachers enjoy tea and coffee and the parents so lovingly give uh, at, you know, they, they'll donate bags of coffee or tea just to, um, just for the teachers. And then the school can, you know, we provide uh, a time and a place so teachers can freely go and get a cup of coffee that's where they can chit chat with somebody else for a couple of minutes before going back uh, to their classroom so having that freedom knowing that they are going to make the right judgment for their students and that we don't have to watch anybody who's going where and how much time are they spending uh, during their breaks they they are all adults and we don't even treat our children like that, right? In the Montessori classroom, children have the freedom to go and do things. So allowing for that freedom. Uh, we celebrate often because uh, food and music does bring people together. So whether you do potluck dinners or um, any celebrations to celebrate, we are a small school, a small successes. We set a goal and when we achieve the goal for enrollment or for a for an event, uh, we celebrate with a simple dinner in at a local restaurant. The environment. What are the what are the policies you have in place to uh, to make sure everybody is on the same page when they join your school? Because no Montessori schools are alike. Your school has its own culture. What makes it unique? What are your policies? And are you providing your new employees, when they come on board with those policies and procedures, are you giving them a tour of your facilities? Are you showing them where things are, where you can organize and keep things? Because once they know where and how things work, they can independently do those things and they don't have to depend on others. We, at our school, we have a buddy uh, program where our, uh, much like New students get buddied with older uh, students or returning students. Our new employees are buddied with uh, employees who've been here longer and they can work with them on Montessori 101. If they're not trained, if they are trained, then uh, what, what are, you know, what's the protocol at our school? So they can freely go to that person from another program level or in an administration department. The um, other part is uh, how can they be successful in their role? Do they have all the tools that they need? Do they have the curriculum? Do they have um, time to plan with their team? So all of the tools that you might think that they need, do you have them? And for their professional goals, how often do you have time for, for teachers to learn something new? One of the things we do at our school during staff meetings, we have an education moment and that's about three to five minutes. So can, um, can somebody teach on your team, teach a small 
thing that everyone can apply. For example, one of our teachers, uh, an assistant, she did a demonstration on how do you take the best pictures of your students? And she gave 10 tips. The music teacher talk, talked about 10 tips to bring music in your classroom. These are very quick. You have that talent in your school and by allowing them to shine, you give them a platform to be recognized as a unique member of your school. So going back to who am I, bring those aspirations in your staff meetings. In addition to that, of course, the uh, Montessori conferences, other educational conferences, what about their personal growth? Is there time for people to come to you and talk to you about um, what's going on? Are you checking in with them regularly? Are you saying hello to them when they come in every day? Um, can people come to you and tell you about their problems? How safe do they feel saying, I need to take a day off because I just need a mental health day or I need to take care of my child? Do you have other, other members who can support that team member on, on those days? So those are some of the things to consider um, for, for your individual needs. Now, coming to your team's need. So now that you've taken care of the individual, who are we together? Because as I said before, your organization is made up of individuals. So how are you um, bringing all these individuals together to go through one mission, one direction, one voice? Mission-related work is always very helpful. Some of the things that we do, you know, do your children know the mission? Do your parents know the mission? Do your students, uh, do your teachers know the mission? One simple thing is you can print keywords from your mission statement on stickers or uh, on cardstock, cut them in a beautiful shape like a star or anything. Everybody picks as they come in, there's a jar to pick one word and that word becomes the focus of the day for them. So this is something that can be done very easily. Um, you can, as a head of school, you can do that once a month, uh, words from your mission statement. What are things that you do for team building? At the beginning of our school year, uh, we take time to plan the school year. And on the Friday before the students return to school, we uh, go to a place close by. So it could be uh, doing, you know, uh, there, there's a place that does trampolines and things like that, rock climbing. So one year we went rock climbing together. Um, and, and all our teachers, young and old, um, all shapes and sizes, all health levels, everybody was able to participate. And it just allows us to laugh together, be ourselves and connect with each other. And one of the things um, you know, if as an administrator, you are committed to it, then everybody is going to follow your lead. But if you say, no, 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 I've got work to do, there's always work to do. You have to make time to connect with your team. You can uh, bring in team building games within your uh, staff meetings, or uh, what about birthdays? Just acknowledging people for their birthdays. Now, it doesn't, one of, one of our teachers over here, she said to me that, you know, birthday celebrations here are really genuine. We really pay attention to the individual and what they like. It's not just, oh, everybody gets a birthday card. Everybody gets to cut a cake. It happens at a staff meeting. That's not how we do it. So some teachers like to have a celebration. Some teachers don't like to have a celebration. Uh, some administrators, um, you know, like to do something else for the children, but the whole school is involved and children make cards. Um, one of our team members had a 50th birthday and she got 50 cards from the school, from, from different um, students. And the whole thing was all designed by the teachers. It didn't come from the administrators, but by allowing teachers to think 
and say, okay, you can do this or you can do that. Just like we would do in the classroom, you would have an individualized plan for your students. Similarly, your teachers can have that individual work. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything in the chat, but um, Camila, will you pay attention to that? Because I'm not able to read my chat at this time. Um, oops, sorry about that. Giving feedback, uh, timely feedback. So on a day-to-day -day basis, we talked about checking in with employees, but also giving feedback that is something working, is something not working. Don't wait to have a quarterly meeting or an annual meeting to give that feedback. It's, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Um, give the feedback in a quick, short manner, stay factual. And um, that feedback is valuable for the iterative process for the employee to take feedback and improve or whatever changes you need to make with that. What are the traditions in your school that acknowledge people? So for example, we talked about birthdays. Um, what else do you do? Do you highlight a teacher at your school? Um, do you highlight the work that they do? For example, uh, any time a teacher has something new that they do in their classroom, they bring to the staff meeting and they show, for example, uh, one of our teachers does acts of kindness and she brought her activity to show. Another teacher does cans of wonder. And these are just cans filled with toothpicks and cardboard pieces, um, some tape. And a child can take that can of wonder and can make something in the classroom. But you can bring a can of wonder to your team meeting and, and see where, where your team can go with it. At the end of our staff meeting, we do I have testimonials. So every staff member will say, I have a testimonial for, and they might acknowledge a coworker or they might, um, even it doesn't always have to be an appreciation or a gratitude gesture. It could also say, uh, I have my own struggles this week. And so people can help them and uh, work with them or support them. What about, um, record keeping as your team's fundamental needs, right? How, how are you addressing record keeping? Are you using a software to keep records? Are the teachers, do they have the autonomy to choose their own record keeping system? Because if there is no buy-in, then how are they keeping records? Is your school as a whole being trained to do a record keeping system? Uh, are there informal records? Are there formal records? How do you hold each other accountable so that you can achieve and you can continue to go in the direction? Yes, we know that um, everybody has their own individual uh, style, but together, what do we look like? There was a wonderful video I saw about murmuration and it's birds just flying at high speed in, and it's a flock of thousands of birds that fly together and they make all these shapes and they're moving at high speeds without colliding into each other. And they're just keeping track of each other at the same time. And so how are you moving through, uh, through your year with your team, allowing everyone to be their own individual, but also together as a whole, going in the direction you want to. And uh, what, you know, getting feedback, giving feedback, being accountable, record keeping, all of that requires the, the administrator to give feedback to the employees, sometimes good and sometimes challenging or difficult. How do you have those difficult conversations? How do you prepare your staff to have difficult conversations? How do you present yourself when you have difficult conversations? What is your mindset going into those conversations? Are you going in with the idea that we are going to come out of this together in a women's situation? Is this going to be an opportunity for us to, to grow? 
is this going to be an opportunity for us to look at other options? So being mindful about these difficult conversations, because there could be a way you could match an employee with another employee and partner them so that they can complement each other instead of one person trying to do something. For example, in my case, I can think big picture, I can visualize the details, but then my office administrator does, uh, she, she holds me accountable by giving me a to-do list every morning that I have to check off and make sure things are done. And there's nothing wrong with that because it helps us both get stronger in that case. So what is the mindset that you present to, to your team? Uh, in terms of uh, meeting your team's fundamental needs, uh, we talked about allowing for, you know, social and emotional um, nourishment is so important to be successful. Is there time for your team to take a break? Is there time uh, to learn the policies and protocols? Are you bringing some um, specialists to, to train your staff in the direction that you want? Because if they're always hearing from you, sometimes they'll stop hearing from you. So it's a good idea to create an environment of learning and nurturing. I really like this uh, picture because your team members are just as fragile as little saplings are. And yes, they may be adults, but we don't know what's going on in everybody's life. And they may appear to be um, all put together on the outside, but we don't know what's going on inside. So handling everyone with care, with, with that nurture, and I really like the word nurture because you're paying attention to the needs. I think a leader is a misleading word. I think it should be a nurturer or uh, a, because you, you can't just tell people what to do. You have to work with people. And then um, what are the benefits? I think um, Nido Marketing did a fantastic workshop. Of, and, and Camila, if you want to put a link to that workshop, it would be great. As small school, we struggle a lot with providing benefits, but people want to come and work at our school. And it's not just health benefits or, you know, a 401k or um, big benefits. They want to be at a place where they feel that it's an ideal place where they love to be. They can be themselves. They can innovate. They can create. And if your school's goals are aligned with their personal goals, people will come to you. And you will be able to find the, the right uh, package for them. You'll be able to create something for them that will align with their aspirations. People are not always looking just for money and for benefits. Yes, that is one part. And yes, we have to pay our bills. And yes, we need healthcare. And we have to achieve those, uh, those items. But there's more to your team than uh, just the money. And uh, how do you show them a path? We have a very young um, graduate who is working with us uh, as an after-school teacher. And uh, we were able to show a career path by taking Montessori training and by showing options of how this young person could grow at the school in three years, in five years. What does that path look like at your school? And having given the path, people have their own lives, things happen and changes happen. You also have employees who uh, move to different locations or they may uh, retire or they may have a baby or whatever it is. One of the things we've been able to uh, cultivate at our school is that even after employees leave our school, they stay connected to our school. And the way we've been able to do it is when an employee leaves, you uh, create a path for them when they 
believe. So it's it's a, uh, you know, as administrators, you probably have a larger network than your employees do. And so by reaching out to your network and saying, here is a wonderful person that I recommend is coming to you, you're creating that bridge, you're creating that trust, you're um, showing that you care about this person. And what has happened, at least at our school, is that even though we have a teacher who moved from Massachusetts to Michigan, he still continues to teach our students uh, through our online platform. So he hasn't really left. He's not here in person, but we meet with him every, every week on Zoom. Our, our students work from the US, our students in India and Singapore work with this teacher and they all meet together on Zoom. So it's a fantastic win-win um, situation for everybody. And we could never have done it if we had the closed uh, mindset that, oh, somebody is leaving and what's gonna happen to our school? Uh, you know, be open and uh, help others. And the more you give, the more you get back. That's That's how I feel. So together, who are we as a team? So we started with who am I? And now we're coming to the question, who are we? And I would like you to think about what does that we look like at your school? What does your team look like? And I would say, you know, at our school, it's that the teachers always say that uh, they feel the love at our school. And when I say love, it's more than just being um, sweet to each other. It's really people taking care of each other, people who are here for the work that they enjoy, that they, you know, uh, uh, we don't always find the right person for the job, but we are able to train people. We are able to... Uh, help people find a role within the school by listening. We are, uh, we are there for the children. We are there for the parents. We are there for our vendors. And there's always a team member who's willing to listen. If I'm busy, maybe it's the office administrator. If both of us are busy, maybe it's a teacher who is willing to, to hear. But to be available, um, I think is is wonderful for everyone to know. And then we are there for each other. For example, we had a teacher out, um, her, her mother was not well and was hospitalized and she was running a, our STEAM fair. All other teachers stepped up to say, we can do it. You don't have to worry about it. And she could take the time off to be with her mother and the school continued because she had set the, the, the protocols in place. She had created all the work that needed to do. So uh, what, what does that look like at your school? Uh, what is the action? The other part is we are a school. You have to continue to do things to survive. You cannot just sit still. You cannot say, oh, we've achieved our potential. And so here we are. No, your actions have to continue because that potential is yet to be achieved. Uh, there is that wonderful word yet, and you're still going. So what is that meaningful work for your, your team? And you can think about, you know, your goals. Is it enrollment? Is it financial stability? Is it accreditation? Is it getting marketing pieces in place? Is it getting the benefits? Whatever it is, for what is that meaningful work for you that your whole team will follow you in your work? And then how do you uh, parse out the rewards for that work that you do? Uh, and when your individuals grow, your business will also grow. So that's what I have learned in my journey as uh, a head of school, as an administrator, that it's not the building, it's not your name, it's not the title, it's every individual in your team that makes your organization. And if you allow each member of your team to achieve their highest potential, 
your team, your school, your organization will achieve its highest potential. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll open this for questions. So what does your team's potential look like? You know, I uh, this is our Peace Rose um, illustration. And I would say, you know, write down, we did this exercise at the beginning. Who am I? I would say, let's take a couple of moments to write down who are we as a team. What does your team's best look like? So let's take a couple of minutes to write down what does your best look like? At our school, it looks like respectful autonomy. There's freedom for all teachers and administrators, yet, and they go with responsibilities. Uh, our students look happy, they're independent, our parents are happy. So those are what our schools, uh, who we are, look like. So, what does your best look like? What would you like to see? I would say dream big, write that down. Uh, let's take a couple of minutes and see what you would like to add. Rupali, what you have described in your, in your uh, current slide, that seems to be everybody's goal. I mean, in terms of uh, um, you know, providing autonomy to your staff members, giving them freedom, responsibility, and having happy students and happy parents. I mean, that's obviously I mean, the same thing that I think I would like to aspire for in my own organization. Looks like you have been able to accomplish quite a bit, quite a bit of what you're saying here. Your place seems like a wonderful place to work. Maybe I feel like joining your school after hearing you. So, so uh, uh, I have two comments here. One is that I mean, many of the points you've made, I think it makes a lot of sense. Do you have an individual who's focused on uh, these kind of things because it doesn't hope, it doesn't happen. Um, I mean, basically by just an administration, basically spending a few minutes here and there thinking about it, it has to be a mindset that one has to be constantly thinking about it. So do you have a dedicated person who thinks about how to make the workplace a better workplace for the staff as well as for uh, the children as, and, and the parents. That's point number one, because um, everybody here seems to be so busy. Uh, the other thing is that in terms of the staff members, I mean, we have two kinds of staff members. There are some who are young. They have their own life also outside the school. There are some others who have families who basically, like most families today, are basically running about 150 miles an hour, taking care of other things outside the, their own responsibility. So given that environment, getting basically more time to spend with them, having occasional lunches and dinners after this thing on Saturdays, meeting with them to doing fun things, Somehow they don't seem to be that receptive because they have so many other things driving outside the school. How do you really overcome that? So those are the things that we struggle with in terms of one on a daily basis. From the point of view of philosophy, we're all in, at least I am in 100% agreement in terms of what you said. It's just a matter of how to make it happen. in The environment with everybody overloaded, administration as well as the staff members. How do you make that happen? I mean, obviously you're doing a good job, but that's a struggle that we have. Right, and, and I would say that, you know, I'm in the same boat. There's never enough time. And I'll answer your first question. Who thinks about how to make the workplace a better place? The short answer is everybody. Everybody is thinking. And so if somebody says, hey, um, could we do this in the kitchen? Could we add, say, this new coffee machine? I'm just making a hypothetical case. Don't be a bottleneck. The administration should not be a bottleneck where every decision, you know, checked off by the head of school or the administrator. Then that's where the bureaucracy starts. 
what freedoms, like, you know, I think about our uh, handbook, our employee handbook, like the constitution. It is a framework. If the teachers and administrators are within the framework, they have the freedom to do, they are adults. And yes, they may make a mistake, but would I not make that mistake? Would I not make any mistakes? We all learn from our mistakes or we learn from each other's mistakes. So um, trusting that everybody in the school can think about how to make this place a better place. At the end of the year, we have one week after, after students uh, leave for summer break, we have one week of um, teacher in service time and that's the time, Wali, that's when we do like go out, we order dinner or lunch from a place or we take our, our teachers to a nice restaurant close by, but it's done within school hours because you are absolutely right. Um, the young people don't want to hang out with us for a Saturday night and the people in the middle, like you said, they have their children's um, obligations and then the, we also have staff that are in their 60s, uh, closer to 70s. And the reason we, I, I absolutely admire them because it's their experience that they bring. And yes, they cannot run 150 miles an hour, but they are the stable rocks at our school. And they've been there and done that. And, you know, they can share their experiences, their wisdom. So, um, I would say empower everyone to think and ask during staff meetings, uh, dedicate time for in-service time to say, how can we make this better? When we have our open house, we do uh, we invite teachers to come in uh, an hour before the open house. So half hour is for a lunch or a dinner uh, before the open house. And then we have the open house. So there's the sense of community even before we start. So try and think, you know, where can you add these? And again, our school is a work in progress. We are not perfect. We haven't achieved it, uh, but we're getting there. And, you know, we make our mistakes and learn from them. The other part is um, about the staff. Um, how, how do you engage staff? Young people are amazing. They have a lot of energy. They are efficient. They can do a lot. They are good with technology. How can you fill their plates so that they feel that they are doing their best, right? So you have to constantly they keep them engaged. And then um, the people in the middle, you have to listen to them. What is going on? They're 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 juggling many balls between their parents and their children and their spouses and their own emotional balance. I think they're the most vulnerable uh, for burnout. And, um, and as I said, we have uh, employees who are above 60 and we really um, work with them for their experience and their wisdom. And uh, they, they are the people who connect, you know, they are our connectors, they are the bridges. They go meet with the community members, they work with our volunteer organizations and things like that. So uh, I would say, look at your, your team members and see what are their strengths. And then what does your, your team's potential feel like? How do your team members feel like at your school or in your organization? Um, are you promoting that? Uh, we, we aspire that for our children. We want our children to feel heard and nurtured and supported so that they can do their best. How do you bring that same uh, gift to your employees. So, so that's something to think about. And then what does your school sound like if you just walk in as a visitor in your school? What, what do you hear? What does, you know, we are sensory uh, animals, just like children. We, we feel, we hear, we see, we touch. And um, what does your school sound like? What is um the hum in your school and you know how are you growing because if you are doing the same thing all the time every year because guess what we started like this and this is who we are then you're static and if you don't change your team is not going to feel the energy so how are you challenging while keeping what's 
what's rock solid by keeping that? What are you doing? So I would like you to kind of consider these questions as you nurture your team and, and achieve your challenges, uh, you know, your potential. The final thing I would say is that um, the culture is driven by your core values. Where is your compass pointing, the moral compass of your school? So with, you know, so we'll discuss any thoughts, any questions, your visions. I would really love to hear what are your visions? Because unless you dream big, you're not going to be able to get your team there. You are the one pointing the finger to the direction and everybody is gonna follow you because they trust you and they believe in you. That's why they're already at your school. They already believe in you. We have a great question here in the chat from Elizabeth. She says, I'm having difficulty balancing time for staff meetings, staff in services, and parents not wanting us to take time off. Do you have any suggestions? So uh, I, I, I uh, hear you, Elizabeth, because um, I think that's a challenge across the board because you only have a limited time during school hours. Do you have any substitutes? Do you have any um, additional, uh, maybe administrators who can, who can cover during lunch or recess? That's sometimes we do that. Sometimes uh, we have the administrators um, covering lunch and recess so that the teachers can meet. Um, do you have time for staff meeting as well as program level meetings? So they're two separate times. And could the children be with a specialist during that time so that the teachers could meet? Are you, uh, I, and I don't know your situation. So if you would like to share uh, that, that, that might be something to think about. You know, sometimes we also bring community partners. So we have African drumming, uh, we have um, animal adventures. So those people come in and that's also a time for the classroom teachers to work on some of their work while the students are with, with one teacher and the presenters. So Elizabeth, go ahead. I know you were just about to say something. Um, well, thank you. Um, we are a small school. We have two primary classrooms and a taller classroom. And I think I can, um, we've been having coverage for each classroom, but when we all want to get together as, you know, all staff, we, every first Monday of the month, we end school at 11 and start our next session at one and get coverage for those kids who are staying, you know, all day for the lunch and that time period, staff are asking for more, um, like a whole Monday off every first Monday of the month, like some of the other Montessori schools. But then I now have parents saying, what's your calendar like for next year? Because you take so much time off. Um, why do you have to have an in-service and staff meetings? And I only have in services like three times a year where we have a professional come in for the whole school. So I don't feel like it's that much, but obviously parents do and staff are feeling like it's not enough. Yeah. So that balance has been difficult. Yeah, we, we don't take uh, a whole day off at our school. We don't even have half days for, for teachers. Uh, because, you know, we serve the working families at our school. And many of our families are either single parents or they are parents who don't have a big uh, family network here. Um, and so, so our, our work is after school. Uh, and then we have three in-service days built in throughout the school and then a week before school and a week after school. 
uh, after the school year, like the two bookends of the school year. Um, so I, I actually hear the parents' uh, conundrum because if if they are planning to work and they cannot send their child to school, then that's a big challenge uh, for them. They have to find childcare somewhere else. But could you, uh, you know, we, we've seen in some uh, schools where they have, it's more like um, an art workshop or uh, you can have a STEM present, a STEM, STEM group, we, we, we are in a city, so we have many resources in the area. But could, a, could you uh, have a resource come to your school where they could engage the children in meaningful work so it's not babysitting and that your staff could get the time off? So for example, as I said, we do African drumming. We do that for three days. So the teachers know, the parents know it's, it's something that add values to the children's uh, learning. It gives the teachers time to work and it, it uh, also helps us differentiate from other Montessori schools or other private schools in the area. So what are things that you could do creatively where you can serve the parents' needs, but also um, help your teachers? And maybe just start with one day for next year and not, don't try to do everything in one, one time. I, I like to take one small step. Rupali, do you have staff meetings monthly? We have staff meetings every week, every week on Tuesdays from 4 to 5.30 in the evening. Is that for teachers and, uh, and uh, other staff members or just for teachers? Uh, for, for the whole school uh, administrators and uh, teachers, not the part-time teachers because yeah. they may not be there on that day. That's a challenge because even, I mean, we normally, I mean, if you have, if you have a staff of like 50 uh, members, to have a meeting for the entire group. Yes. And you have once a week. I mean, we are struggling with having even once a month. Hmm. Because um, of the fact that people, people just don't want to, I mean, once the school is over, they want to kind of head back. Uh, yeah. As as possible. It's, it's built into our contracts that they're committed to the weekly staff meetings. I see. And perhaps, you know, for 50, 50 is a large number for a meeting. Uh, yeah. So perhaps they could have program level meetings or uh, I don't know the structure of your school, uh, but it might be better to split in smaller groups because in a large meeting like that, there's only one or two person people talking and it's not a very productive meeting then. And I'm so sorry, Vali, I don't know how you do your meetings. I shouldn't speak about that, but my experience has been Working with smaller groups, smaller teams is more effective. There's an action plan, there's work done, there's time to learn, and then, um, then we move, move on. Bye, Elizabeth. Thank you for joining. There's some great creative ideas here in the, um, in the chat about um, how to solve that issue that um, Elizabeth was mentioning. Um, Tina said we did that once when all uh, all wanted to go to a conference. We had a whole school field trip to the bowling alley with parents and kids. The teachers got to go to the conference. Um, she also said our school has program meetings once a week after school during contract time and then once a month whole school meetings after school. Great. Thank um, you for sharing that. Mary Lou, did you want to say something? Oh, yes, you're still on mute. Sorry, thank you. I'm not currently running my school. I did for 45 years. But over time, what I kind of worked on, and it was a process, it didn't happen right away, is I really found great value in that before school began, when you had new teachers coming aboard and all of that, and you talked about getting together. Well, I found that to be invaluable. and. On one occasion, I happened to have been at a church and heard an amazing young priest talk. And I had a nice chat with him and I learned that he had been a Montessori trained um, 
and he taught middle school Montessori in Canada. When, so we became friends and I invited him to our opening meeting and he asked me what I wanted him to talk about. And I said, well, I think what I'd like to get across to my faculty is that this really isn't a nine to five job, it's a vocation. And he said, oh, that's a topic I can talk about, <laughs> obviously, because he was priest. But it was so nice in that we, uh, we started by um, talking about the role that we play in the lives of our children and their families and really the importance of that role and how it is a noble role that each of us plays. And we then talked about the vocational aspects of it. And, and that same meeting, I reviewed our mission and our vision and our core values. And so from that point on, with every meeting, we always started with our mission, mission, vision, and core values. And we made it a focus for the year to sort of renew ourselves in terms of our, our commitment. And it had a great impact in terms of there were less complaints about the meetings we had that we're talking about here today and so on. But I also learned to keep meetings short, things that I could send in memo form, I sent out. The meeting had to have something of substance, otherwise no one likes a meeting, right? And so um, it's partly, I, felt, I think I just wanna add that being very intentional and mindful about your employees' time and yes, celebrating them, acknowledging them, and letting them know that you are there to support them and that we are all there to learn together. So I just wanted to share that. Well, thank you very much, Mary Lou. Well said. Um, Len Lenny. Yeah, something we started doing um, this year because we school-wide had this idea that we want more mindfulness in our classrooms is that we start off our meetings with the di with different teachers leading us through like breathing exercises or some stretching or something and it always kind of just gets us into a better mindset like ready and more centered and focused and then um i may have lost what i was thinking of other than that but that's some so we have some rituals kind of like the way teachers have rituals in circle time is oh the other thing i was going to say is that um often well we share the agenda ahead of time so the teachers know the purpose of it of the meeting and it's yeah they're like 45 minutes long the meetings uh, once every three weeks and we end with the reflection on our mission statement which i already shared and then during the time when we are you know meeting and discussing it's um we sit in a circle like on the floor and teachers often need like the, the back chairs you know we can't sit quite like crisscross applesauce the whole time but we um whatever it is it's always like a question that we're trying to solve together so it's it's not just like me giving them information and saying like digest this and understand this and then make this you know come true in your space it's something which we're solving together and then we're setting kind of like next steps and goals and then so we follow up so I think that makes it seem more um I don't know just like something that like we're working on as a team and that it just doesn't like end as soon as the meeting is over you know we, we come back to it yeah yeah, I, I think those uh, traditions are very helpful. And I really look at the team in the same way that I look, I look at it as I used to run my classroom, because we are all individuals and you, uh, it's no different than the children, just the, the level of complexity is different for adults, that's it. Mm -hmm. But being respectful, I think, um, you know, your team is a, machine that needs routines, rituals, maintenance, to be well-oiled and to run well. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, we, to do pleasant things with each other, it, it is the administrator's role to, to lead in a pleasant, dignified manner, treating everybody with the same dignity that they would like to be treated. And I think with uh, that approach, you know, you can do quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Any other last minute questions or comments before we wrap up? Thank you so much, Rupali, for sharing your presentation, um, all of your ideas and your creative solutions. And thank you for everyone who participated and pitched in their solutions and how, um, 
how they aim to be great leaders or what you do at your school to make your staff feel inspired and happy in their workplace. I'm going to drop my email in the chat if you would like to see a certain topic or a specific um, thing discussed at a future town hall, you can email me about it or if you'd like to speak at a future town hall, you can also get in contact with me. We're happy to give you a platform to share your expertise with the community. Thank you so much again to Rupali for a great presentation and thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Good luck everyone with your teams.